Okay, so can people hear me out the back? Yes, yes. Cast my voice in just the right way. So hello everybody, my name is Matthew Dentis. I'm a recent graduate of the Department of Philosophy here at the University of Auckland. I wrote my PhD on the epistemology of conspiracy theories. So my particular field of specialty is social epistemology and applied epistemology. I'm curious as to how people form beliefs about the world and then what kind of evidence counts for those beliefs, how they apply those beliefs in making decisions, and what counts as warranted belief, i.e. what kind of beliefs are the best to hold given available data, evidence, and the like. And so social epistemologists are concerned with the kind of social beliefs that people have about the world. They're concerned with how do people form political beliefs, how do people form beliefs about whether they should listen to a rumour and act upon that rumour because it may well be true, or should they treat that rumour as being vile gossip? And my particular interest was looking in what do we do with conspiracy theories? Because we can all point to examples of suspicious conspiracy theories that we know are examples of unwarranted beliefs, beliefs you shouldn't hold because they just don't have the right kind of evidence behind them. But we can also point to lots of examples of conspiratorial activity in our Western political history, which indicates that sometimes people have put forward a claim of conspiracy, a conspiracy theory, if you will, which has turned out to be justified given the evidence. And so I was curious to know whether an adage which goes all the way back to Karl Popper, whose book The Open Society, your particular leaflet is named after, uh, where Karl Popper actually talked about what he calls the conspiracy theory of society and put down the notion that conspiracy theories are inherently suspicious types of beliefs is actually the right kind of suspicion to have. Is this suspicion actually based upon the evidence? And I spent four and a half years basically writing a PhD exploring that issue, and I'm going to present some of that, but of course not all of it, in the next half hour, otherwise we'd be here. I have to do a, a reading of the PhD, which would be nice, I have dulcet tones, I enunciate the words nice and clearly, but it would take a long time to actually read the PhD out, and I'd need people to do funny voices for the footnotes, parentheses and such like. So we'll try and keep this as moderately amusing, but serious all at the same time. And you'll notice my talk is called We're All Conspiracy Theorists Now. Uh, I'm going to assert this initially as a fact, but actually it's not a fact at all. I'm going to argue for this position that we should consider ourselves to be conspiracy theorists. But I'm going to tell you now my argument has what could be taken to be a notable problem or objection, which is that it only works if you accept two stipulative definitions of the term conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorist. So I'm going to stipulate a definition, we're going to work with that definition, and hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll agree with me that those definitions I've used are good, and then you're going to embrace the fact that you are conspiracy theorists, I'm a conspiracy theorist, we are all conspiracy theorists, and you'll go out into the world looking for conspiracy theories, testing them and seeing whether they're good or bad. Some of you will be persuaded by it by the end, others of you won't, those of you who won't, it's due to a large-scale educational conspiracy operating within the nation-state of New Zealand, <laughs> which is blinding you to the truth of what's really happening behind the scenes. So I'm also going to put forward an unfalsifiable position to justify people who don't actually adhere to my argument by the end of today's talk. Now, one of the problems with talking about conspiracy theories is no one likes to be labelled as being a conspiracy theorist. Conspiracy theorist is a pejorative term. It's a term that, where it is applied to you, someone is probably insulting you. Uh, this is Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky famously uh, did work in linguistics. He's now a political philosopher. One of the things he talks about is this thing called institutional analysis. Part of the notion of institutional analysis is that people wrongly put down conspiracies as causes for events when really they're the way that large-scale institutions work. So Chomsky likes to use the example of what happened in the Microsoft antitrust case of about a decade ago. Microsoft were charged by the American government for conspiring against developers and stopping them from getting access to the APIs that allow you to write programs that hook into the Microsoft Windows platform. 
Microsoft's response to this after they did an investigation was, we weren't really conspiring. The problem is Microsoft is a giant corporation. It is immensely huge. And it's also very badly structured. So when a developer rings up and says, hey, I need to find out how the file selector dialog works so that programs will pick up particular kinds of metadata and then open when I double click on them, you get the person on the Microsoft end going, oh, you need to talk to Dave. I'll put you through to Dave and you put them through to Dave. And then Dave would go, no, no, Sally's the person who deals with these things. I'll put you through to them. And then Sally would say, no, no, I thought Dave dealt with it. Oh, Dave doesn't deal with these things. Oh, it must be Ernest who deals with these things. And you'd kept on be swapped about throughout the entire system, such that it looked as if Microsoft was quite deliberately trying to keep you from having particular bits of data. Now, people had charged Microsoft of using this obfuscation technique basically to conspire against developers. Microsoft's response was, no, we're a really badly set out organization. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, and thus there's no conspiracy. It's an institutional fault. And this is the kind of thing that Chomsky is interested in. He thinks that most people get the claim of conspiracy wrong. They blame conspiracies when actually it's the faults of large-scale institutions like corporations and governments that make things look conspiratorial when actually they're not. It's just dysfunctionalism within the corporate or governmental structure. So Chomsky doesn't like to be called a conspiracy theorist. He likes to be called an institutional analyst. He says most conspiracy theories, if not all, are actually examples of dysfunctional institutions operating such that they look conspiratorial when they're not. This chap, Christopher Hitchens, was quite happy to be called a conspiracy theorist. Uh, he was a conspiracy theorist about the October Surprise thesis, that actually there was conspiracy by the Republican nominee, Ronald Reagan, uh, in cahoots with the Iranian government to ensure that the hostage crisis was manufactured such that actually it secured Reagan's election. And he was always happy to endorse this particular conspiracy theory. He said he was a conspiracy theorist. Oh, thank you. He was happy to be a conspiracy theorist. He was happy to go against the status quo, the official story or explanation of that particular event. Uh, arguably, also, Hitch was a kind of conspiracy theorist about the invasion of Iraq, because up until his dying day, he maintained he'd seen a CIA dossier which said there were we weapons of mass destruction in Iraq which justified that invasion. Uh, now, given that no one else has ever seen this dossier, and there's an inquiry going on in the UK at the moment, which somewhat proves the dossier never existed, either Hitch was lied to, so he was involved with the conspiracy as a patsy, or it may well turn out that Hitch lied to try and justify his particular position, which was taken to be anomalous at that particular point in time. But he was willing to be a conspiracy theorist and also willing to use that label to refer to himself. He always said, I am a conspiracy theorist about the October surprise. But most of us would like to utter the phrase, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but. Uh, the but clause in English is one of the greatest clauses in our vocabulary. People who say, I'm not a racist, but, always follow the but with a statement which is going to be quite definitely racist. And this, of course, you do something like, I'm not a racist, but I do like to talk about racists. So you can do a humorous term. But normally, if you say, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a racist, the but indicates you're going to say something which is an exception to the claim that I'm not a racist, which somewhat shows that you are going to make a racist claim. And the same is true of the I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I hear this all the time. People will say, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do think there's something suspicious about the moon landings. I think that NASA may have faked them. Or, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do think there's a cover-up going on in Devonport to hide the real extent of tunnels located under North Head. Now, as soon as someone says a particular claim of that type, they're essentially admitting to believing a conspiracy theory, but they don't want to be labelled as a conspiracy theorist. People don't want to be called conspiracy theorists, even if they hold what are prototypical conspiracy theories. Uh, and we've got a nice image here 
of one of the main targets for conspiracy theories up in the 60s, now supplanted with regard to uh, research by 911, uh, the wonderful Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, and he's in there because when I was writing up the original text of the speech, I managed to put him down as being a pasty as opposed to a patsy, according to particular <laughs> conspiracy theories things. Uh, okay, so what is a conspiracy theorist? Well, a conspiracy theorist is someone who believes some conspiracy theory or promotes a conspiracy theory. So you can be a conspiracy theorist who believes conspiracy theories but never mentions them to anyone. Most people turn out to be conspiracy theorists of this type. They'll go, well, I don't want to admit to being a conspiracy theorist, but I'm really suspicious about this thing over here. And then a few people will end up being the kind of people who are conspiracy theorists who will admit to it and then try to persuade other people to join them in their belief. And we can show lots of examples of this. Uh, there's good old David Icke, the famous footballer who then became a BBC journalist, uh, then came out as being the messiah, and now promotes a thesis that avian shape-shifting reptiles control the royal families and aristocratic families of the entire world, and the Queen Mother used to drink human blood and eat human children. She's dead now, so that role's been taken on by probably Kate Middleton. Uh, <laughs> Jenny McCarthy, she's prom she promotes the notion that the MMR vaccine <clears throat> is responsible for the epidemic of autism that's going on at the moment. I, say, I should say epidemic there. Uh, there's a whole definitional debate there as to what the epidemic of autism is actually meant to actually symbolise. Uh, Pamela Geller, she's one of the many American Republicans or Tea Partiers who is trying to put forward the notion that Barack Obama is not the legitimate president of the US because actually he was not born in the state of Hawaii, or if he was born in the state of Hawaii, his father's paternal status as a Nigerian meant that he was basically unqualified to become president, or some particular claim. And so they want to claim there's a large-scale governmental conspiracy being orchestrated by the New World Order, such that America is now being controlled by evil socialist forces, probably originating from Russia. Uh, John Dewey. Uh, John Dewey, American philosopher, son of the person who came up with the Judecimal system, famous for his role in the discussion of the Moscow show trials from the 1930s. I'll be talking a little bit more about John Dewey later on. Uh, and Richard Bellamy. Richard, was it David? I can't I can remember his first name. David Bellamy. So, used to be famous for presenting nature programs, now famous for being a climate change denier, uh, who claims that the reason why he's no longer on TV is entirely due to his political views. Uh, and he's also involved in a variety of other weird beliefs in New Zealand. He recently endorsed the notion that the ancient Egyptians got to New Zealand first. So there was a Greek-Egyptian voyage across the Pacific, and they colonised New Zealand before anyone else got here. Uh, it's this bizarre book by this guy called Max Hill, which is one of the most unreadable books you could possibly ever imagine, having self-published and then sold in shops. Uh, but I read these things because someone has to. <laughs> now, New Zealand actually does punch above its weight when it comes to conspiracy theorists. Uh, we've got Ian Wishart. Of course, he has a quite popular and successful magazine uh, called Investigate, which I discovered the other day when I was looking at old issues in the library, is now a magazine which has a his and hers section. So there's Investigate for him and Investigate for her. It's the same magazine, but you flip it over, and you've got the woman's section at the end and the men's section at the beginning. And the woman's section has cooking tips, and conspiracy theories about sex education. The men's section has conspiracy theories about politics and guys to buying boats. So it's not only conspiracy magazine, it also seems to belong in the 1860s. Uh, John Ansell, a former ad guru for, for Labour National Act, and I think did some work for the Greens, uh, famous for the Iwi Kiwi billboards, now is promoting this thing called Treaty Gate, which is the claim that actually the Treaty of Waitangi has been willfully <coughs> misinterpreted by the New Zealand government for quite some time uh, to give all the land and money back to Māori, and it's part of a large-scale PC conspiracy to deny white people their rightful place within the New Zealand world. Uh, Jonathan Isom, 
He is the person who publishes Uncensored. Has anyone here ever read an issue of Uncensored? It's essentially the internet for people who don't have the internet. They're all articles from the internet which have been simply pasted into a desktop publishing program with the hyperlinks unchanged. You get these sections of blue text on printed paper you can't do anything with. Uh, then essentially if you had the internet uncensored is basically available for you without having to buy it every three months. It's a bizarre magazine. Uh, Brian Leland of the New Zealand Climate Science Coalition, uh, so one of the prominent members of the Skeptical Brigade in regard to climate change in New Zealand, one of the men who tried to sue NIWA uh, with respect to the climate record, uh, supporter of Christopher Monckton, who's coming out here soon for his climate tour, uh, and seems to subscribe to this thing called Agenda 21, which he claims to be a large-scale conspiracy by the UN to put people into concentration camps around the globe to allow nature to reassert itself, uh, which seems to be based upon producing an entire literature on a three-line summary in a UN report from several years ago. And actually, our most successful conspiracy theorist, uh, Vinnie Eastwood. Uh, you probably don't know about Vinnie Eastwood. He's not known particularly much outside, uh, inside New Zealand, but he has a five-hour conspiracy theory radio show that plays in the US, gets endorsed by people like Glenn Beck and Alex Jones, and is probably our most successful conspiracy theory export we have in the country. Uh, and if you've ever met a conspiracy theory, you can guarantee that Vinny believes it. Basically, he's open to all conspiracy theories. Uh, he has particular opinions upon my credentials. Uh, he thinks that I have waxed lyrical too much about 9-11 and I'm retarded for the views that I hold. Uh, and New Zealand has lots of its own <coughs> conspiracy theories, so we've got vast right-wing conspiracies, we've got vast left-wing conspiracies, uh, so we've got the claim that national parties looking after the rich by selling our assets, dumbing down the population, mining our national parks, promoting anthropogenic climate change, while the left is involved in enforcing political correctness, uh, promoting the thesis of anthropogenic climate change, uh, destroying democracy by the implementation of MMP, and there are all sorts of examples of conspiracy theorists uh, like Peter Shirtcliffe, Brian Leland, actually Peter Shirtcliffe occurs a lot in this particular diagram, Garth McVicker and such like. Uh, you've got generic conspiracy theories about the establishment, ones that don't require any left-right split, and then of course my favourite from several years ago, a whole variety of conspiracy theories about really what happened in the September 4th earthquakes down in Christchurch, uh, where they were either caused by Freemasons or they were aimed at free Freemasons. So the Freemasons do not come out well on either side of this particular debate. Uh, they were known about by particular agencies uh, and may have been caused by God or possibly caused by the Large Hadron Collider or the Harp installation in Alaska. So New Zealand punches above its weight when it comes to claims of conspiracy. Now, the kind of people who typically believe every kind of conspiracy theory you can possibly imagine, like Vinnie Eastwood, uh, are people that we tend to call conspiracists. These are people who have a pathological need to believe any conspiracy theory they hear. Uh, they might be what you call a conspired world theorist, the kind of person who believes the entire world is basically run on conspiratorial lines, and because of this, everything you hear about is liable to be the result of a conspiracy somewhere in the background. And it's important to note, not all conspiracy theorists are conspiracists. Lots of us could end up holding one conspiracy theory in our collection of beliefs, but not necessarily endorse any other conspiracy theory. And we'll talk about an example of this where we probably all hold at least one conspiracy theory with respect to a particular matter in a minute. Conspir conspiracists are the ones that people get worried about, and they often think the pejorative notion of conspiracy theorist is actually pointing towards conspiracists. These are the people we're worried about being lumped in with. If someone says that sounds like a conspiracy theory, are you a conspiracy theorist? We don't want to have a, we don't want to be identified as having a pathological need to believe. We might, in some cases, have a warranted belief that a particular conspiracy theory might be amongst the best available explanations for us at any given time. 
Now this basically raises a question, what is a conspiracy theory? We know about conspiracists and conspiracy theorists, uh, but we need to actually answer the question, what counts as a conspiracy theory? And this is where my stipulative definitions coming in now. So I take it that a conspiracy theory is simply any candidate explanation, so a potential explanation of an event, that cites a conspiracy as being a salient cause of that event. So under that definition, all a conspiracy theory is, is an explanation that cites a conspiracy as a salient cause of the occurrence of some event. So if you've got a claim of conspiracy, you've got the claim that there exists some set of agents who intend some end whilst acting in secret. All three of these conditions need to be satisfied for a claim of conspiracy. You have to have more than one person. Conspiracy implies people working together from the verb conspire to breathe together. They need to intend some end, so they have to have a plot or a caper or a plan, and they need to be acting in secret. We take it that these are three necessary and sufficient conditions for any claim of conspiracy. So once these three conditions are satisfied, and you could show that these three conditions then show a link with some event in the world, then you'd have an explanation of an event that cites a conspiracy. An explanation of an event that cites a conspiracy, under my stipulative definition, ends up being a conspiracy theory. Now there are consequences for holding my particular definition. The first, any explanation of conspiratorial activity will count as being a conspiracy theory under this definition. If you have ever organised with a family member a surprise party for a child or family friend or family member and that person had a suspicion that you were organising something in secret to achieve some end, they would have had a conspiracy theory about the organisation of that particular party. My definition rules in what appears to be a very commonplace activity, which is c clearly conspiratorial, as also being a conspiracy theory. It also, if we take the surprise party example as being a, an exemplar of a conspiracy theory, automatically means they don't necessarily describe sinister states of affairs. You could have conspiracies of goodness. Now the second feature is less controversial than the first. We can all imagine conspirators basically acting towards what they think is the common good. Very few people actively engage in evil in a moustache twirling fashion with a monocle and a top hat going, I shall now commit a dreadful evil across the world. Most people think they're doing the right thing. It's just that when it comes out, people go, well, you're acting in secret, which means it was slightly suspicious, and you can kind of see why people thought your particular plot and caper was sinister, because if it was good, why not do it openly? But we all know there are some situations, like organising a surprise party, where telling the person about the surprise would actually ruin the intended event. You want to surprise the party, sorry, surprise the person with the party, so you act in secret. These things are suspicious, but they're not necessarily sinister. Well, the first event, the fact that the surprise party might qualify as being a the explanation for surprise party, might qualify as being conspiracy theory, is the kind of thing that people go, oh, just slow down there, Matthew. Why would you do that? Talk about that in a second. Uh, the third feature, if we accept this analysis, it automatically turns out that all of us are going to be conspiracy theorists because we should all believe surprise parties occur. We should all believe that some people have suspicions about the plotting and running of surprise parties. Ipso facto, we are all conspiracy theorists. I can go home now. But it's not really that simple because this is all relating to this first feature. My definition is very open. It admits all sorts of things into it. And so I need to give an argument as to why we should accept the consequence of my, step, my stipulative definition and actually work with it, which is what I'm going to kind of do now. The reason why I have a very open in the definition of conspiracy theory is that to a large extent the literature that exists in philosophy, psychology, sociology, critical theory, culture studies, media studies and such like, assumes that conspiracy theories are bad beliefs to hold. Now, if you assume conspiracy theories are prima facie unwarranted beliefs, that colours the entire analysis 
that basically comes out of your discussion. The question is, is it actually justified for us to have this suspicious view of conspiracy theories? My analysis basically turns the tables. We're going, look, if we have a really open slather definition here, we can actually test lots of intuitions about conspiracy theories by going, look, if this thing is a conspiracy theory, would it be warranted to believe? Okay? This thing which is similar to it, which is also going to count as a conspiracy theory, would it be warranted to believe? At which point do we go from this conspiratorial activity is suspicious to this particular conspiratorial activity is something that we should admit into the pantheon of good explanations for an event? And that's what I'm going to talk about now, using the wonderfully classic example of 9-11. All right, who here believes that 9-11 was an inside job committed by the executive branch of the American government to create a state of terror within the US? You don't want to admit to that particular view? Most people don't in this kind of setting. If you do want to admit to that, you can talk to me afterwards. Who here thinks it was committed by 11 hijackers working for an organization now known as Al-Qaeda? This is a naming issue here that Al-Qaeda, as we know it, didn't really exist prior to the 9-11 event. Uh, that was basically designed to have an attack upon American soil to show that America is not immune for what it does in the Middle East. Who thinks that's a good theory for the explanation of the events of 9-11? 19. Hmm? 19 hijackers. Oh, well, so 11 for the two planes that actually struck the, the Twin Towers. Yes, there are. Then you've got the other planes, so two other vessels. Uh, all right, so most people are willing to accept that the official story of 9-11 is the best explanation of the event. Now, the story of 9-11, either way you look at it, is an example of conspiratorial activity. If you accept the terrorist story, you're talking about a set of agents who intended some end and operated in secret. This is classic conspiratorial activity. If you accept the inside job hypothesis that actually the events were created by the executive branch of the American government. You also are making the claim there was a set of individuals, George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, who all worked together to create an act of terror within the American state to then justify some further draconian measures. These are both examples of conspiratorial activities both of which are put forward as potential explanations for the event, they are both conspiracy theories of some particular stripe. The question is, why do we like one conspiracy theory better than the other conspiracy theory? What is it about the claim that it was Al-Qaeda who committed the event to 9-11 that makes it such a good explanation as opposed to the rival explanation that it was actually committed by George W. Bush, especially given that people really quite like to hate George W. Bush. <laughs> Why not lump in to our hatred of George W. Bush the notion he also committed an act of terror upon the American people? This is a very interesting question. And yet most of us, although not all of us, there's a disturbing thing about all of us as in the country, as opposed to people in this room, uh, there's a disturbing thing about 9-11 truth New Zealand is one of the countries that has actually had the most success in the promulgation and support of the 9-11 Truth Movement. A few years ago, Richard Gage, uh, who works, well, actually came up with architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, gave a series of talks, one at Te Papa, one at the, one of the union sites along Great North Road, and has had the biggest audience outside of the US attending his talks in New Zealand. There were 450 people at Te Papa. I went to that particular talk. Uh, and there were, I think, 160 at the Auckland talk. And he's never had an audience that big outside of the US. And he's toured the entire world. 9-11 Truth as a thesis is actually quite popular in New Zealand. Uh, another good exa example, and this is actually a nice historical one, the Moscow show trials. So in the 1930s, Joseph Stalin was very concerned about the activities of Leon Trotsky. Leon Trotsky being the person who had supported Stalin, Stalin had supported Trotsky during the revolution. They were both seen as natural successors to Lenin, but they both had very different views about how the communist revolution should work. Stalin was of the firm belief 
that for communism to be successful around the globe, it had to first cement the revolution in Mother Russia. Trotsky was of the opinion that the only way to make communism work was to ignite the revolution in every other country, and then all communist nations would work together to cement communism as the way of life. This difference in opinion led to a split in their friendship, and Stalin, who we now know to be a deeply vicious man, basically made sure that Trotsky was kept out of the way. Trotsky essentially went into exile. Now, Stalin was paranoid, and he was concerned that Trotsky was actually agitating behind the scenes to return to Mother Russia and cement his control and basically take control of the Communist Party. So he had the proto-KGB investigate Trotsky. The proto-KGB came back and said, look, Trotsky doesn't care about Russia anymore. He's trying to ferment communism elsewhere. He's given up on Russia. Stalin's response to that was, that's not good enough. I need evidence that he's actually trying to return back to Russia. You need to get it for me. So over nine months, the proto-KGB, with the authorization of Stalin, engaged in psychological and physical torture for a large number of former associates of Leon Trotsky, such that they would testify in a trial apparently willingly, that Trotsky was conspiring to take over Mother Russia. And these are the Moscow show trials of the 1930s, which led to a very large number of people being put to death for being the sympathisers of Leon Trotsky. Trotsky always denied this was going on, and John Dewey, who I mentioned previously, organised a commission of like-minded left-wing academics in the US and the UK, who notably all hated Stalin, to investigate the trial transcripts and check to see whether the verdicts were actually sound. Their verdict was, these trials are inconsistent. People claim to be in two places at the same time. Someone met Trotsky's son after he was dead. The evidence basically didn't stack up. They presented their findings to the government of the UK and of the USA and said, look, these trials are not fair and honest. The governments of the UK and the US said we will check with the people who know about these things. They went to the Russian embassies and said, look, is this to be believed? Russia said, no, this is a vapid conspiracy theory. It is an example of disinformation. This is where the term comes from. It's a Russian term, which basically applies to the Dewey Commission's notes on the show trials. And so up until 1956, the official story of Russia and the official belief of the UK and the US was that the show trials were free and fair. But after Stalin died, Nikita Khrushchev admitted that actually they had manufactured the trials and the Dewey Commission was largely right on all substantive matters of fact. They had been called vapid conspiracy theorists for their views, but actually it turns out they had hit on the right explanation. It just it turned out the governments of the day trusted another government that was complicit in the conspiracy rather than actually looking at the evidence and going, oh, that looks a bit suspicious. So these people, the uh, people in the Jury Commission, these are not people in the Jury Commission, these are the accused in the Moscow show trials, they basically put forward a conspiracy theory. They were labelled as being conspiracy theorists in the pejorative sense. They were vindicated 26 years later and shown to actually have had a good explanation of the event that no one wanted to listen to because it was not politically expedient at that particular point in time. So if you were what the Soviet government labelled a conspiracy theorist about the verdicts of the Moscow show trials, then you would have been right to think they were a sham, but only if your reasons for believing the verdicts were a result of elaborate conspiracy was based upon a good inference to the best explanation. And this is the lovely thing about the Dewey Commission report. You can look at the Dewey Commission report and you can analyse the evidence put forward by the Dewey Commission. You can compare it to the trial transcripts that were produced by Russia. These were in open court, so all the transcripts were available. And you can judge which is the better explanation and then infer which is the best way to go. Now, this then brings us to the crux of the matter. It's not enough to show there exists a conspiracy. Lots of conspiracies exist within the world. Governments engage in small-scale conspiratorial activity all the time. Sometimes they get caught out, sometimes they don't. Corporations engage in conspiratorial activity all the time. 
family members engage in conspiratorial machinations against other family members all the time. There are lots of conspiracies. They don't all necessarily explain some event within the world. You can imagine a world where people conspire all the time and they're largely unsuccessful because they're not very good at conspiring. They get caught out before anything actually <coughs> happens. For a conspiracy theory to be a good explanation, you need to show there's a tight connection between there being a conspiracy which intends some event and the actual occurrence of some event. And this is the other worry we have about the term conspiracy theorist and conspiracist. We're worried that a lot of people assume lots of conspiracies go on and then infer that because there might be lots of conspiracies going on, conspiracies are the most likely class of explanation in the world. Well, as actually it may turn out there are lots of conspiracies going on, but actually most of them don't result in anything particularly notable. Sure, lots of people conspire to give surprise parties to their children, bringing delight and happiness to people across the globe, but maybe government conspiracies are fairly unlikely and they often get found out by the actions of our investigative open press and such like. To be a conspiracy theorist, someone who not just believe, well, someone who believes that view and then maybe wants to promote that view, you need to show there's a tight connection between a claim of conspiracy and the inference that's the best available explanation on the table. And that might be where things fall down for the discussion of conspiracy theories and the warrant of them, because that might be an incredibly difficult burden of proof for people to discharge. You first of all need to show that there's a group of people acting in secret, intending some end. That's quite difficult to do. If they're acting in secret, they are liable to be engaging in activities which are hard to investigate. Now, if you can show there exists a conspiracy, that's pretty good. But you then need to show that even though if there was a want to conspire and people actually formed a group to engage in a conspiracy, that they actually achieved some particular event. We can all imagine a situation where the new American right, when Bush II got elected, were going, look, we really want to cement our control of the country because we don't like the Democrats. And we really want to make sure that it's going to be a Republican government going forward. And you can imagine them drawing up documents describing the best way to change electoral boundaries or to ensure that certain people don't get to vote in elections. And so you can have an intention to conspire that doesn't necessarily mean they do anything with it. You can show there was a conspiracy, but it doesn't necessarily eventuate in the explanation of some event because it wasn't acted upon, or they failed to get it through, or the paperwork got messed up and the document went to the wrong office and people didn't find out what the plan was meant to be until very late in the game. Okay, let me talk about some worries about this particular story I've been telling. Hello. So, one worry that people have about belief in conspiracy theories is this. They'll say, Matthew, okay, maybe we should do an open slather approach to talking about conspiracy theories because it allows us to test the warrant of them to see whether they're backed up by good evidence. And yes, we should always believe things based upon the evidence. So maybe we should be conspiracy theorists about some events. But surely the big issue here is the worry about the conspiracist. Surely we should be concerned that belief in conspiracy theories engenders too much scepticism about the kind of world we live in. Surely the worry about conspiracy theories is that actually it makes us doubt all kinds of official information. And when we doubt all kinds of official information, maybe we stop being politically active or we don't think there's any point doing anything if there are people operating behind the scenes. Now this is a big question. Several philosophers like Brian L. Keeley and Lee Basham had been investigating exactly this particular type of phenomenon. But the problem is, even if conspiracy theories engender a radical scepticism about the kind of world we live in, we've actually got to ask, is such a scepticism actually inappropriate to behold? We live in a relatively open society, not a perfectly open society. There's still a large amount of hierarchy within our society where people can do things behind closed doors and we're not likely to find out about them. But we're also aware that when our politicians act in public, they sometimes do things that don't seem to be well evidenced, 
They sometimes do things because they seem to have been paid off by the right kind of person. They sometimes do things because they've got political agendas or duties to fulfil to other private individuals that mean they act in what appear to be inappropriate, maybe even conspiratorial ways. And so there is a big question here. Should we actually reject belief in conspiracy theories in general and belief in specific conspiracy theories because we're worried that they're going to engender a kind of scepticism? If it turns out that actually we should be more sceptical about the kind of political and social arrangements we have than maybe we currently are. Many people think that humans end up being very naive with respect to trust in public institutions. Because once you start investigating public institutions, actually it turns out they act in a far more willy-nilly, maybe possibly malevolent fashion than we're actually willing to admit. Sometimes we don't want to admit to these things because it would make our political belief seem rather intangible if it turns out that people do things for reasons other than evidence. Uh, and the current government, and I'll, I'll apologise here for being overtly political, uh, is quite obviously quite a fan of pushing through ideology rather than actually looking at evidence-based policy. And when you have governments which push through ideological concerns about, say, the structure of the education sector, rather than looking at the evidence as to what a good education sector would look like, you are not living in a perfectly open society. If people are going to make decisions regardless of the evidence, public opinion and such like, our society is not as open as it should be, and we should be somewhat sceptical about its operation. The other worry is, actually, no matter what we say about the warrant of individual conspiracy theories, like the Mo Moscow show trials, or the notion that, yes, maybe we could call the outside job hypothesis, the notion that the Twin Towers were brought down by terrorists, rather than terrorists operating outside the US, rather than terrorists operating within the US political system, lots of conspiracy theories turn out to be implausible. There are, I mean, I, if you go back to the earlier slides, which had the variety, can I actually bring those slides up? Once upon a time I could. Yeah. No, I can't. Uh, we look at the variety of different conspiracy theories within the New Zealand sphere of conspiracy theorising. Most of them, if not actually all of them, turn out to be implausible beliefs about the world that some people hold. And surely part of the worry about conspiracy theories is that there are lots of them and most of them are implausible. But this is not a feature which is unique to conspiracy theories. There are lots of theories which count as being scientific, so they're formed in the right way, they are falsifiable, and most of them actually turn out to be implausible. The history of science is basically the history of replacing one scientific theory with another because evidence eventually showed it to be bad and better theories were able to be supplanted. The history of modern science is about lots of competing paradigms and competing theories which are in play and experts are sorting through which research programs we investigate and which ones we carve out and we don't fund. The fact there are lots of theories out there and a chunk of them end up being implausible is not a feature unique to conspiracy theories. It's a feature of the way that we theorise and systematise our knowledge about the world. So the fact there are lots of implausible theories in the conspiracy sphere doesn't tell us much about the plausibility of individual conspiracy theories, nor does it give us particularly good grounds to be sceptical of conspiracy theories unless we want to make some broader claim that most conspiracy theorists are conspiracists, people with a pathological view towards these things, but I argue that actually most conspiracy theorists are people who hold to one, maybe two conspiracy theories about things. Most conspiracy theorists are not the kind of people who believe every single conspiracy theory they encounter. And we'll find lots of nice examples of that in the sciences. People who have a naive belief in science. If a scientist said it, it must be true, which then means you suddenly get incoherent belief structures because they'll have, find a physicist who's endorsed creationism, or they'll find a biologist who's endorsed uh, climate change scepticism, and they'll go, but a scientist said it must be true. And you'll get kind of radical examples of naive scientific belief. And there's also naive atheistic belief. There are lots of people who are atheists for entirely the wrong reason. 
And we have to be aware that just because people have bad reasons for holding beliefs, that doesn't necessarily tell us about the class of belief that they actually hold. There are also some benefits to the kind of analysis I wrote, and this is where we come to our, our close. So, one of the things about acknowledging that we should all be conspiracy theorists, or admit that conspiracy theorists is not a pejorative term that we should apply to conspirators, but simply apply to people like us who might hold to some conspiratorial explanation of an event, is that it can remove a lot of the toxic nature of the kind of debates we have. We're all aware of political discussions we have with friends and family members where someone will put forward a conspiracy about this government or that government or the real reasons for what's going on in the background. And if you accuse your family member of, of being a conspiracy theorist by saying, actually, that sounds a bit like a conspiracy theory, that's the kind of thing that really riles them. And so you might get into a shouting match or you might get into one of those awkward situations where the family member doesn't want to talk to you for several weeks, months, or even years. I have a cousin who is a trained naturopath. She got her degree from Australia, and I have to quite carefully avoid having any discussions about alternative medical modalities uh, because I'm quite aware it could cause friction within the family because I'm liable to say your doubt about modern medical practice sounds slightly conspiratorial and she's bound to take that in the wrong way because she'll take conspiracy theories to be a pejorative. If we all admit that we all hold some conspiracy theories about the world, we can have open and frank discussions about which conspiracy theories are good. Is there really a conspiracy by Big Pharma to deny funding to the investigation of other modalities? Or is that a vapid conspiracy theory, which is based upon not understanding how funding models work within the West? If we can remove the toxin, we can have much better public debates. Also, okay, we often put entertain, con I have no idea what that first sentence is, is meant to mean. I think it's meant to mean we often entertain conspiracy theories. We often engage in our own discussion of conspiracy theories. We want to have a discussion about whether there's really a secret agenda by national to do particular things in the background, or whether the Greens really are just the old-style communists hiding their true intentions behind an environmentally friendly image. And so we put these things forward, we entertain them, and we often want to investigate them by asking questions of other people, saying, look, do you think this is plausible? Now, if that person just automatically labels that thing as being a conspiracy theory and says, that's qua irrational, the debate is shut down, the investigation ends. Well, so if we all go, yeah, let's entertain this conspiracy theory. Let's see where it goes. Let's see whether it's based upon any good evidence. You get a much better, once again, public debate going on within the world in which we live. And, of course, almost all of us at some particular point in time will have said I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but. <laughs> Why go about doing I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but? Why not say I am a conspiracy theorist, and actually what I want to talk to you about today is the following. At which point, once again, decent public debate could be ongoing to allow you to have a discussion about what's really happening behind the scenes, or the fact that you might be tragically mistaken about the real intent of the alien shape-shifting reptiles, which secretly do control all, all of us. And if I had the finances, I would then have got myself a nice skin suit, and I'd unzip myself and then appear to be a reptile wandering about the room, which would be a spectacular end to the talk. But unfortunately, I am a lowly recipient of a PhD from the University of Auckland who isn't, doesn't have the uh, kind of financial background to engage in large-scale special effects at this particular point in time. So, instead, we just have to come to the fact that maybe if you don't want to be conspiracy theorists, you can put yourself forward as being a public intelligence analyst. Someone who's simply trying to find out how the public actually works. And actually, when you think about it, uh, when you think about conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists, we already have a class of person within the political landscape, the spook, who deals with this particular kind of thing in a quite deliberate way. And they're liable to have lots of beliefs about conspiracies operating in the background of our society. And they're going to be conspiracy theorists, but of a qualified sense. 
And of course, sometimes they may just be conspiracists. We sometimes worry about our secret service within New Zealand when they leave briefcases with pornography and pies outside of the houses they're surveilling. This did happen back in the 1980s. Uh, but maybe that was part of a grander conspiracy uh, to make us think our secret service is in fact ineffectual to hide what they're really doing behind the scenes. And that, as they say, is that. Mm -hmm.